Thursday, February 22nd, 2024, at three, about 3.07 p.m. And I call this meeting of the Senate Elections Committee to order. And a quorum is present. This committee has a robust agenda, and we want to be able to accomplish this session. And we need to be sure there's adequate time for this discussion and this debate. And to, balancing, to balance these two needs, we will probably continue the process we established last year. DFL authors have, for the most part, been sharing their amendments with the author and the public before the hearing. I'd encourage any, my Republican colleagues to do the same if possible so that good ideas can be worked through and incorporated. Regardless of whether you choose to share amendments ahead of time, after we hear from the testifiers, we will ask if there are amendments to be offered. I'll in, I will ensure that each member has the opportunity to speak to each bill, but may, may not be able to accommodate members speaking more than once. We may need to go late or schedule additional hearings on Fridays or the other days af after we finish our agendas. Today, for example, we're hearing three bills, including ranked choice voting, the local option bill, which is a variation of the bill that we spent hours discussing last session. As such, I anticipate uh, voting on the bill by 4.30. If we are not able to do that, we will lay it on the table and proceed to other bills on the, the agenda. And we'll return tomorrow at 12.30 to continue the discussion. With that, we'll begin with the, the uh, bill SF3868 with Senator Morrison. Welcome to the committee, Senator Morrison. Please get you, settled and proceed with your presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Senator Morrison, I see that you have an author's amendment, an A5 author's amendment. I do have the A5, Mr. Chair. Yeah. And that was provided, provided to the committee. It's in your packets and the, and the public. And uh, that you'd like to get adopted to make the bill to be in the shape that you uh, would like it considered. And Senator Westland moves to adopt the A5 author's amendment to SF 3868. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? The, the motion passes and the amendment is added. Senator Morrison, please proceed with your opening comments. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair and members of the Senate Elections Committee, uh, thank you for the opportunity to, prevent, to present to Senate File 3868, the Local Voices, Local Choices Act. Last year, we had a robust discussion in this committee about a different bill about ranked choice voting. The bill before you today is simply a local option bill that gives all localities in Minnesota the opportunity to adopt ranked choice voting for their communities if they want to. I've heard again and again from people on both sides of the aisle who are concerned about the toxicity and division of our politics and how it's harming our democracy. Ranked choice voting is a way to help decrease that toxicity and division. It allows voters to rank candidates in order of preference and ensures winners with the majority or the highest support possible in a single decisive and cost-effective election. In ranked choice elections, candidates must appeal to their opponent's supporters for second and third choice votes, and they do that by running positive campaigns that focus on policy solutions rather than personal attacks. That's exactly the antidote we need to heal our political divisions and promote more civil, representative, and inclusive elections. This bill is necessary because under current law, only charter cities with odd year elections, which is less than 1% of Minnesota local jurisdictions, have the ability to adopt ranked choice voting today. This bill gives all cities, counties, and school districts the option to decide if ranked choice voting is best for their community. The bill has no mandates and promotes local control allows jurisdictions to adopt ranked choice voting by ordinance, resolution, referendum, or amending their charter if they have one. It allows for the creation of standards for implementing ranked choice voting in both single and multi-seat nonpartisan elections. It gives the Secretary of State rulemaking authority to establish additional standards necessary for jurisdictions to establish additional standards necessary for jurisdictions to implement ranked choice voting in even years and across multiple jurisdictions. 
And finally, it provides for state certification of ranked choice voting equipment and tabulation systems, allowing for faster election results. This bill is about local control, empowering Minnesota communities to make decisions about how best to run their local elections. Uh, and Mr. Chair, with that, I've, if I may, I'd like to ask Senate Council to walk us briefly through the bill. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, or Mr. Chair, um, and Senator Morrison. Uh, when I do the walkthrough of the bill, it will be as amended by the A5 amendment. And I will try to be brief because uh, I know you, Mr. Chair, said we want to try to be done with the bill by 4.30, but can answer any questions um, after the walkthrough or after the testifiers uh, as is appropriate. Section 1 of the bill on page 1 adds a cross-reference to the new, newly created Chapter 204E, which you'll hear me reference. Chapter 204E is a new chapter of law which includes all of the ranked choice voting uh, provisions. Section 2 on page 1 has to do with ranked choice voting um, elections and requires votes cast in the ranked choice voting to be counted as uh, provided in Chapter 204E instead of under current law. Section 3 on page 1 provides that candidates in a nonpartisan ranked choice voting election must be omitted from the regular primary ballot. On page 2, section 4 is the start to the new Chapter 204E and provides that the 204E governs all use of ranked choice voting and the regular election laws do apply except for as otherwise provided in this chapter. Section 5, starting on page 2, provides definitions for Chapter 204E. And you'll see that the definitions continue through page 5. On page 5, section 6, is the authorization for adoption of ranked choice voting. And there were some changes to this section um, in the A5 amendment. So after January 1st, 2025, or adoption of rules by the Secretary of State's office, whichever is later, cities, counties, and school districts may adopt ranked choice voting um, for use in local office elections. Um, and they may use them in even and odd years. Section 7 on page 6 sets up how ballots work uh, in ranked choice voting. If there are ranked choice voting and non-ranked choice voting in the same election, they are on the same ballot card but are separated. Section 8 requires a ranked choice voting ballot tabulation center and specifies when those tabulation centers must be available for public observation. Uh, provides when there may be a recess in the count, talks about how write-in votes are counted, and talks about tabulation of the write-in, or talks about tabulation of votes. On page 8, section 9, talks about tabulation of single-seat ranked choice voting and goes through the process of the various tabulation rounds that need to be done for ranking uh, ranked choice voting. On page 9, section 10, it talks about the same process, only if there are multiple seat elections. On page 11, section 11, talks about reporting results and the specific information that must be included in the reporting results, and it also talks about canvassing in that section. On page 12, section 12, it talks about recounts and how recounts may be required or requested. On page 12, section 13, it provides the post-election review, when it is required, how it is selected, and how it is conducted. There are some changes to this section as well on page 13. There are some lines that have been deleted because they are either duplicative or unnecessary. There are also standards of performance by the voting machine um, and additional review that are specified here. At the end of the section on page 14, it talks about reporting results and what happens if there are changes from the post-election review. Those have to be incorporated into the official results. On page 14, section 14, the Secretary of State is required to adopt rules necessary to implement the requirements of Chapter 204E. And that's the final section in the new chapter of 204E. And then it turns to some conforming changes with the start of section 15. In section 15, if ranked choice voting is to be used in election, the notice of filing dates must indicate that 
the method of election to be used. Section 16 um, was replaced by the A5 amendment and this requires the voting system to be used to in a ranked choice voting election must be must include a test lab report from a lab accredited by the EAC um, and must meet other um, requirements as provided in that section. Section 17 makes some formatting changes to, to, to break the subdivision into two paragraphs. You'll see at the top of page 16 there was a paragraph C that has been deleted by the A5 amendment. On page 16, section 18 sets forth some requirements for purchasing equipment used to conduct ranked choice voting. Any equipment used for this purpose must meet the requirements specified in this section. On page 17, section 19 uh, makes a general change to the post, um, excuse me, to the public accuracy testing and requires testing to be done at least three days before all voting equipment is used. And that includes testing of the ranked choice voting equipment. And there are some specific, change, uh, some specific details for testing that equipment. On page 17, section 20 um, was deleted by the A5 amendment. And that is the bill, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Stangle. I think we're ready to go to testifiers. Uh, the first testifier that's on the list is St. Paul City Council Member Annika Bowie. Would Ms. Bowie step up to the microphone, please? Okay, we'll go to the second, uh, second person on the list, and that's uh, Christina Scipioni, Bloomington City Clerk. So, Ms. Scipioni, I think I know you. <laughs> <laughs> Please identify yourself for the record and continue with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. My name is Christina Scipioni, and I am the city clerk in Bloomington. I have been administering elections since 2008, and I was responsible for implementing ranked choice voting after it was approved by Bloomington voters in 2020. I am speaking in support of two provisions of this bill. First, I am in support of statewide standards for ranked choice voting. Consistency is key in elections. Voters in Egan should have the same experience as voters in North Branch or voters in Rochester. Statewide standards make it easier for all to understand how elections are administered, which increases transparency and trust in the electoral system. Additionally, statewide standards lower the barrier to entry for communities that want to implement RCV, but feel overwhelmed by the daunting task of creating an electoral system from scratch. The second provision that I'm speaking in support of today is allowing the use of federally tested RCV tabulation software. Bloomington has used RCV in two local elections. We've used both tabulation methods that are currently available, spreadsheet method and the hand count method. Both tabulation methods are a manual process which delays results reporting. Delayed results reporting provides room for misinformation to spread and can diminish trust in the electoral process. Software exists that would automate that RCV tabulation process, but current law does not provide for its use. Allowing the use of RCV tabulation software will minimize the time needed to hold tabulation rounds. This results in the quick of results reporting that our voters have come to us to expect from us. Thank you for your time today. As an election administrator, I appreciate your consideration of these provisions. Thank you, Ms. Scipioni. Uh, next person I have on the list is Minnetonka City Council Member Paula Romali. Please identify yourself for the record and continue with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. My name is Paula Romali, and I am a Minnetonka City Council Member. I'm here in support of the bill. Um, Minnetonka has used ranked choice voting uh, for city council elections for two cycles now, and I was elected to council in Ward 3 this past November. I was a first-time candidate. I ran for an open seat against two other candidates, and I won by a margin of four votes. 
And that result was confirmed by a recount that was conducted superbly by our election staff. Now, this was Minnetonka's second RCV election, and for voters, it brought more choices, more engagement, and more turnout. For candidates, including myself, it encouraged us to, be, to do more outreach, and it also encouraged more civility. And it also meant that our voices and ideas weren't extinguished in a low turnout August primary. Under our old system in Minnetonka, primary turnout in August averaged 5%, and that discouraged candidates from running unless they had strong local networks as a real estate broker or a lawyer or something similar. But RCV doesn't have primaries, and that meant that all three candidates in my race had their voices heard in the marketplace of ideas all the way up until Election Day. Because candidates need to earn second choice as well as first choice votes, RCV incentivized us to reach out to a wider range of voters. It also encouraged candidate civility because going negative isn't just wrong, it alienates potential second, vote, second choice votes. RCV has dramatically increased voter turnout in Minnetonka. Last year, we were at double that of similar cycles in the past, 100% increase. In sum, with RCV, more candidates are running, engaging, and listening to residents, and they're campaigning in a respectful manner. This, in turn, has fueled greater voter turnout, which may well be why residents voted resoundingly against an effort to repeal RCV in 2023. I think Minnetonka's, Minnetonka's experience proves that smaller cities like ours can transition to RCV successfully, and it will be even easier for them to do so with the standards and equipment that this bill also provides. So again, I thank you for your time and attention, and I encourage the committee to approve this bill so that all Minnesota communities have the option to adopt RCV. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ramili. Uh, next on the list is Bemidji City Council Member Lynn Eaton via Zoom. And I want to remind people we're, we didn't announce it, but we're trying to maintain about a two minute interval with uh, testi testifiers. The prior ones have been real good at uh, being concise. Thank you. A good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and, and committee members. My name is Lynn Eaton. I am from Bemidji, Minnesota, where my wife and I have lived for almost 40 years. Our three children were born here and educated here and now have families of their own. I've been a public servant my entire life. For 30 years, I served the Department of Transportation and following my retirement in 2014, I continue to work as an engineering consultant. In my professional profession and capacity as an engineer, I have seen how much citizens depend on well-run services and how partisanship at the state capitol causes shutdowns, cynicism, and unacceptable delays and interruption of planning cycles. These service interruptions and delays are costly. Time taken to develop important public works goes to waste when our legislative representatives choose partisanship and legislative gridlock over collaborative discussion that enhances the common good. The citizens of this state and my community deserve the service and respect that broadly supported elected officials can provide. We need to choose between candidates who are willing to do the work of the people they represent instead of adhering to political affiliations and ideological thinking. I currently hold a non-political office as a Ward 5 Counselor for the City of Bemidji. My presence here today and the thoughts I convey are my own. I am speaking for myself and my belief that our children deserve better service from our elected officials. I believe voters, especially younger voters, are so disillusioned by today's political rhetoric, partisanship, and legislative stalemates they decide not to step into the voting booth to choose between two political ideology, ideologies. For them, that is not a meaningful choice. On March 16, 2023, the Bemidji Charter Commission voted to forward a resolution of support for ranked choice voting to the Bemidji City Council for their consideration on March 20. 
of 2023. That resolution passed council unanimously. There is genuine interest and excitement about the positive benefits of this method of elector representatives and the return of local control. My service includes volunteering for professional and public organizations, leading civil, civic organizations, as well as leadership roles within my faith community. I have discussed the idea of ranked choice voting with my fellow council members, others in my constituency, my family, and my family's friends and acquaintances from all across the nation. All of these conversations have noted the positive potential outcome from the opportunity to vote by ranked choice voting. Lastly, we must take steps today to give our children hope for a brighter, more positive future. Our Ashinaabe neighbors make decisions while thinking of the next seven generations. I challenge our state's highest legislative authority to do the same. I ask you to vote in favor of ranked choice voting. Thank you very much for this opportunity to be heard. Thank you, Mr. Eaton. Uh, next, we have Mary Hartnett, Executive Director of Clean Elections, Minnesota. Please identify yourself for the record and continue with your testimony. Um, uh, Mr. Chair, Mary, uh, members of the committee, my name is Mary Hartnett, and I'm the Executive Director of Clean Elections Minnesota, a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization that advocates and educates for a strong democracy in Minnesota. We support SF uh, 3868, the Ranked Choice Voting Local Options Bill. Only 15% of our Minnesota cities are pre presently authorized to adopt RCV for their local elections. This means 85% are prohibited from conducting their elections as they think best. Over 14 cities and counties have passed resolutions supporting RCV for local elections in Minnesota. We should listen to them. RCV offers a way to bridge divides in our country due to polarization. RC, uh, uh, RCV, um, Cities have proved their citizens with, um, have provided their citizens with the right to support all candidates without fear of spoiling the election for major party candidates. This is true democracy. RCV encourages candidate, encourages more people to run for office and that encourages more diverse candidates. That supports American democracy. Three years ago, I ran a city council campaign um, with, that had seven great candidates. They were for ages 23 to 72, running for the same seat. To court voters, each candidate had to listen and show what they had in common with other candidates to win their support for their second and third slots. My candidate came in second, but I felt that the process was fair and that the issues that were important to voters had been deliberated and elevated. At present, only five Minnesota cities had the benefit of RCV. This bill does not compel adoption of RCV, but only provides that option. The people will decide. SF 3868 allows local governments to choose the electoral process that it believes suits their jurisdiction and that its citizens support. Please support democracy in this local option. Vote to adopt Senate File 3868. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hardnett. Um, Mr. Wiesing, um, I'm going to, uh, well, well, we'll have you testify, and then we're going to go back a little bit because uh, uh, Council Member Bowie is here. So we'll, we'll have Council Member Bowie follow you. So thank you very much. And please uh, identify yourself for the record and continue with your testimony. My name is Tom Wieson. I'm a citizen of Minnesota. Um, I would like to dispel a common myth used against ranked choice voting, which is that ranked choice voting violates the one person, one vote principle. This principle is largely referenced in redistricting gerrymandering court cases that intends to convey the idea that all votes should have equal weight. When used as an argument against ranked choice voting, it assumes that our current system has one person, one vote, which is blatantly false. There were four different opportunities for a Minnesota voter to cast their vote to elect each and every one of you who are sitting here today. The general election, a primary, a political party convention, and a caucus. Political party conventions are where the real power lies. Only the select few of the political party faithful elected at private party caucuses get to participate in the political party conventions. When I say few, I'm talking about 2,200 GOP and 1,200 DFL delegates out of 4.2 million Minnesota voters, or less than 0.1%. Uh, 
In the 2022 Minnesota state elections, 375 out of 376 GOP and DFL convention nominated candidates won their primary by an overall average of over 95% of the vote, making primaries more ceremonial than representative of voters' desires. All eligible voters can vote in the general election, but the outcome is, with few exceptions, predetermined by the demographics of the political party manipulated district lines. Of the four voting opportunities, the one with the highest participation rate has the least weight, and the one with the lowest participation rate has the highest weight. Make no mistake, the current Minnesota election system does not have one person, one vote. There have been many court cases that have determined that instant runoff voting and ranked choice voting does not violate the one person, one vote principle. Ranked cho cho rank choice voting levels the playing field by allowing everyone's votes to have equal weight at each round of voting and does not ban anyone from voting. Please vote yes on SF3868. Thank you, Mr. Wiesen. And now we'll have uh, St. Paul City Council Member Annika Bowie. Ms. Bowie, please identify yourself for the record and continue with your testimony. Thank you, Chair Carlson, also the chair of the, um, or excuse me, the election committee. My name is Anika Bowie, and I am a St. Paul City Council member of Ward 1. I've seen a lot of familiar faces here um, on this committee as I have came several times over, I would say, the past decade, champion voting rights and stronger democracy. Uh, before I was an elected official, I was a community organizer, and I I often um, built my you know, reputation and career with electing progressives um, and just electing just really good-hearted grassroots um, leaders across the state. And uh, one of the things that, one of the tools that made it very um, useful with having conversations on the doors was the ability for us to have ranked choice voting in the city of St. Paul. I'm here to support ranked choice voting and allow other cities to have that option to utilize this great democracy tool, um, not only from a perspective as elected, but also from a perspective as a community organizer and knowing there is a, a ecosystem to build more advocates to have more healthy conversations. Here's some of the points um, I want to list in terms of why I think ranked choice voting is important. It ensures that our elected officials better reflect the diversity of backgrounds and political preferences of our, con our constituents. RCV empowers voters to rank their candidates' preferences, leading to the formation of broader coalitions, which is particularly beneficial for underrepresented communities. RCV opens the process to more candidates. Um, like myself, for example, um, when I ran for office, it was it actually opened up the door for seven other um, candidates to uh, run and speak to their platform. And Ward 1 is actually one of the most racially and economically diverse communities. And we um, actually applaud and, and encourage more leaders to step up to the plate and make sure more issues are brought to the conversation. And ranked choice voting allowed for those conversations to happen and those coalitions to be built. Studies also show that ranked choice voting can accelerate the representation of women and people of color in office in the historic city council election in St. Paul of 2023 that I'm honored to be part of a first time ever all women city council. Um, six of the seven um, of the council members are women of color is a prime example of what the outcomes of ranked choice voting um, can produce. And I was uh, also want to speak to the positive impacts on how my campaign uh, was ran um, for city council and encouraged me to talk to more voters. Um, all of you are all elected officials um, and understand you know, the, the responsibility having to raise the most money and the pressure of having to um, uh, target who your demographic is, right? But when you have ranked choice voting, it actually allows you, the competition is more so around how many people you're going to have genuine conversations with, right? And um, in creating those more authentic relationships um, in your communities versus uh, whoever can create the most uh, smear campaign. So um, it allows you to also reach out beyond your core supporters and beyond your comfort zone. Um, I was honored to uh, not only be asked, but just 
not, I was, excuse me, I was honored to not only ask people to be my first choice vote, but for them to show up to the ballot to vote, right? Um, and it gives them more liberty and more autonomy as a voter on um, where they want to put their choice. And I had a rich and engaging conversations with voters um, and shaped how, you know, even if I wasn't their first time, um, or the first choice, you know, it still created that opportunity to talk about the issues that are nonpartisan in St. Paul. And um, in closing, I just want to say uh, there, all the candidates are representatives of their campaigns were allowed to watch ballots being counted um, in my race. So like I said, there's a total of eight people on election day. Uh, we were able to see all the ballots being brought in, and I ended up having more, 20% uh, more, um, had to do a recount. And that also um, allowed for our Ramsey County Elections uh, Office to uh, really engage with the community on the process of how the um, outcomes would be, and also, uh, you know, encourage um, for our staff to not only count our ballots, but also uh, see how people uh, engage in a range of different candidates. So after, I would say, uh, five rounds, you know, I uh, was uh, fortunate to be elected, um, but also it just showed, like, all of the hands and all of the, um, the coalitions that goes into making sure that we are uplifting not only ranked choice voting, but giving people the invitation to uh, participate in their democracy and not feel like that they have to only show up if they know that one person that they have to choose. So thank you. Thank you for your complete story, Ms. Bowie, or Council Member Bowie. Uh, next person is uh, Sarah Bertzinger. Hi, my name is Sarah Bertzinger, and I'm from Pine Island, Minnesota. I'm actually here speaking in opposition to this bill today. Um, so the question is, if the state is going to promote uh, an election system, shouldn't we make sure that's the best system available and effective? Ranked choice voting uses a multiple tabulator system, and that's where my concern lies. Multiple rounds of voting is basically what it does, and this increases the risk for errors. As a nurse, I have to do three different checks to give one single medication because we know of the reality of human errors. We also know that, or I'm sure everyone's experienced a time where technology has not done what we necessarily want it to do. Um, and so my question is, why are we promoting a system that increases the chance of errors? Um, there's also, well, in Maine 2018 is just one example of how it disfranchises voters. In that primary election, over 126,000 votes were cast, but only 117,000 votes were counted at the final round. That means that over 9,000 voters lost their voice. To me, that's unacceptable. Every voice counts and matters and should be heard. The system delays results, which makes election, which turns elections from an event into more of a mundane process, and my concern is that that's going to disfranchise voters, that's going to decrease voters, and that's going to decrease the turnout. Um, this system is cumbersome, cost-inducing, and difficult to audit, all qualities that induce public mistrust. Our country has an amazing history of promoting civic engagement, and yet polling suggests that a growing majority of Americans on both sides of the aisle fear for the survival of the American system. Trust in our elections remains quite low. And is this the best time to push a new system? And earlier this week, I heard a quote. It said, easy to vote, hard to cheat, and so believable that both sides trust the results. Cannot agree with that more. So please do not vote to pass this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Birchinger. Uh, now we have uh, Diane Steen Hinderley. Please identify yourself for the record and continue with your testimony. Again, my name is Diane Steen Hinderley, and members of the committee and chair, um, I'd like to uh, give a few remarks here. I'm one of the early advocates and uh, as a worker for ranked choice voting. 
and um, I started in the 90s, but I'm going to talk about an experience I had in the 2006 uh, election, which was the a ballot initiative to get ranked choice voting into Minneapolis. And it was a cool day, and it was felt by the organization leadership that there should be some of us from the promoters of RCV to be out there at polling stations in case there are lingering questions about this new method at the time. And so I went there to help with voter education in a South Minneapolis uh, polling place. And um, an election judge came out of the building and hurried out to me. And he introduced himself as a retired professor of education psychology at the University of Minnesota. And he said, you shouldn't be out here. He said, government itself should be doing this on its own. And then he went on with a statement I've never forgotten, which is, the current system is the most primitive form of human assessment that there is. And uh, that was a, a quite dramatic uh, phrase, which I will always remember. And I pondered this, um, and I've, I've learned that most government documents that get to the public are geared towards an eighth grade education level. And so I thought, well, I wonder if this mathematics of RCV uh, what level that's at, like when do students learn that. And so my sons had gone to Peter Hobart Elementary in St. Louis Park, and so I called there and I said I wanted to talk to the teacher who's most um, in charge of or aware of math education for our elementary students. And a woman did come to the phone eventually, and she we discussed the topic for a while, and then she said, we don't have to teach ranking. They learn this in preschool. And that was also something I will always remember because um, it's uh, definitely, if we gear the, the narratives towards eighth grade, we certainly can uh, have the mathematics of this be at a preschool level. And so I just want to close with um, the, the, the phrase that the lesson of democracy is that the bottom should have reasonable control of the top and ranked choice voting helps facilitate this. And it, it does create better problem solving. And if problems aren't solved that well and there's conflict, it's better for conflict resolution. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tinderley. Could I uh, ask you to sign up on the notebook that's up there as a, a testifier? And also, uh, unfortunately, we had the notebook closed. And so uh, if anybody can come up there and sign either now or later on. Um, we do like to keep a list of the people who have testified. So we can, we can set that on to the bar there too. And next we have Hennepin County Commissioner Kevin Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Please identify yourself for the record and continue with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Committee. Uh, I'm Kevin Anderson, Hennepin County Commissioner. Um, I am, pardon me for just one second while I pull up my information. Uh, today I represent my perspective as a County Commissioner uh, to advocate for the implementation of a statewide standard uh, for ranked choice voting. I personally believe that the adoption of RCV is a strategic move towards enhancing the quality and fairness of our electoral system. As you already know, ranked choice voting introduces a method where voters rank candidates by preference which can profoundly impact the inclusivity and representativeness of uh, elected outcomes. This system ensures that elected officials win by a true majority, uh, reflecting a broader consensus among voters. As an elected official in a nonpartisan office, I believe that it's a critical step towards depolarizing our political environment, encouraging candidates to appeal to a wider audience. From an administrative standpoint, counties play a significant role in executing local elections. The lack of a statewide standard for RCV presents a logistical and financial challenge complicating the training of staff, 
the procuring, uh, procurement of voting machines, and the education of voters. A unified approach would streamline these processes, allowing for more efficient use of resources and ensuring consistency in voter experience across the state. The importance of a statewide standard ensures that all voters, regardless of their county of residence, participate in a uniform voting process. This consistency is vital for maintaining the integrity of our electoral system and building public trust in the outcomes of our elections. I really encourage you to uh, consider the significant benefits of adopting a statewide standard for anyone who chooses to implement ranked choice voting. Such a move would represent a commitment to improving our electoral system for all constituents and enhancing the democratic process in our states. Thank you so much for your consideration. Thank you, Commissioner Anderson. And, and finally, on the list, we have uh, Secretary of State Steve Simon, who is going to testify via Zoom. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Can you hear me and see me okay? We can hear you just fine, Mr. Secretary. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Member Steve Simon, Minnesota Secretary of State. Thank you for indulging this uh, remote testimony. Normally, I make every effort to be with you in person, but I'm on the road today. Hello from... Uh, the Grant County Courthouse in Elmo Lake. Um, I used to carry a version of this bill when I was in the Minnesota legislature in the Minnesota House of Representatives. And I did so for um, a very simple reason at the time. And it, it, it's, it's a reason that still motivates me today to testify in favor of this bill. You've heard testimony before me at this committee about the merits of ranked choice voting. And you've had a number of eloquent testifiers talk about why it's a good system. That's not really the reason that I'm here. I think people who have doubts uh, about or even skepticism about or even hostility towards ranked choice voting can support this bill because I think it's about equity and it's about simple fairness. Right now, as one of the testifiers said, you have about 15 percent of the cities in Minnesota who are even empowered legally at all to experiment with ranked choice voting. We know that five of those cities have made that choice. Uh, sometimes through actions of a charter commission, sometimes through a vote of the people, as in Minneapolis. But nonetheless, they've made that choice. There are 85% of cities who are barred from even making that choice. So if, if you are a statutory city, you have to come on bended knee to the legislature and get special permission. If you are a charter city, like the five that already have it, and they tend to be the bigger cities, you can do it on your own. And that never struck me as fair whether you like ranked choice voting or not, whether you think it's a good idea or not, and reasonable minds can differ on that point, it is not fair that a giant category of Minnesota cities are prohibited under law by themselves from even experimenting in the process. So my view of the world on this issue is let cities experiment with ranked choice voting. They might find they like it, in which case they can keep it. They might find they and their voters dislike it, in which case they can ditch it. It really is as simple as that from my standpoint. It's about local control, local choice, with a system that some people may love and some people may dislike. But that's not the point. The point is, should all cities in Minnesota have the ability to experiment with this system, or shouldn't they? I think the answer is yes. And so for that reason, I'm here to testify in strong support of this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Um, now we're ready to go to uh, amendments. And if there are members of the committee that have amendments that they'd like to offer, we'd like to hear them now. Mr. Chair. Senator Tran. I have an amendment. And then Mr. Chair, will we be doing questions after the amendments? After, after each amendment, yes. Or how, about, how about on the total bill? We'll do, we'll do it on the total bill as well. Okay. Mr. Chair, I'd like to... Wait, do we have it? I don't know if I have it. Mr. Chair, hold on. Thank you. Mr. Chair, I'd like to move the A1 or the A4 amendment to Senate File 3868. Senator Cran uh, moves the A4 amendment to uh, Senate File 3868. Senator Cran. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is a simple amendment. Uh, Senator Morrison's heard this one before. <laughs> the, uh, um, when this bill was brought before us and we went through it in elections last year and state gov last year, we had a variety of 
conversations. And one of the key things was to remove barriers in, in the process, right? I think it was remove barriers, um, increase uh, diversity and participation of candidates, and, and, uh, and that was, it was one of the primary reasons to do that. And I think our dialogue was around what were the barriers? And the reality is, is there were no barriers from anybody to signing up and paying a simple $20 filing fee to run for a city council or a mayor of a major city, Minneapolis or St. Paul. But what we found over time is the only place that barriers now exist at a pretty significant level are in the cities that have added ranked choice voting, particularly St. Paul and Minneapolis. And so their fee, which had no barriers prior to jumping into a race for $20 for a mayor and $20 for a council member. The organizations pushing this, um, particularly the organization Fair Vote and a variety of other nonpartisan nonprofits that um, have been before us uh, many different times, they've all led and championed to install the barriers. And so now to f file for mayor, it's a $500 uh, entry fee into the game. For city of St. Paul, it's $500. Does anybody know what it costs to run for governor? $400 for the state of Minnesota to run for governor. The barriers are lower for governor than it is for the city of St. Paul and Minneapolis. And all as a result of the uh, ranked choice voting. And so we've seen those barriers um, put in place because it actually, on the first rounds, achieved one of the stated goals in allowing increasing participation. And I think one of the first races in Minneapolis had some 30 plus candidates for mayor. And so what did they do? Immediately, the press, the leader of the Fair Vote Organization, Jeannie Massey went out and said, boy, I'm behind that charter amendment. This was horrible, it was confusing, and it's not good for us to push this effort forward because it doesn't help us at all. But it was very accurate. So they got behind a charter amendment to move that fee to $250. Now it's actually $500. So the barriers that have been put in, put in place are a result of the people who brought this process forward under the guise that most of it's led locally. There are local supporters here, and, and, and they believe in it. But most of it's been funded with dark money that supposedly everybody around here hates, but is very welcome into our municipalities um, to overshadow the actual will of the people because it comes to a, a, a dollars and cents and who can afford to, to bring the biggest army to the table. And most of that's done with outside money, outside of our communities where it's been put in place. So what this does is it simply allows um, to help achieve one of the stated goals is to not put barriers. And so this, all this bill does is really simple or the amendment is limits the filing fee to no, no more. We would want to increase it as many of you have many that are lower but it limits it to no more than $25 for one of the elected offices. Mr. Chair, I'd request a roll call as well as um, encourage a yes vote. Thank you, Senator Quirin. Uh, Senator Morrison, do you have some Thank you, Mr. Response? Chair, and uh, thank you, Senator Quirin. Um, I feel that I have to push back a little bit on the dark money references, um, but I would actually like to hear from someone from the Secretary of State's office for an opinion on this amendment. We have uh, the Deputy Secretary, Nicole Mitchell, that is approaching dais. Please identify yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the Office of the Secretary of State doesn't um, set candidate filing fees, so I don't know that our office has any strong advice to provide on this topic. Um, we don't, we don't set filing fees in our office or collect them that's done um, either at the state level or the local level. And so I unfortunately don't think our office has any advice on this amendment. Okay, Please identify yourself also. Oh, apologies. Uh, Nicole Freeman, Office of the Secretary of State. Thank you. Thank you. M Mr. Chair, I would um, urge a no vote on this amendment. This is not really what this bill is dealing with. So I would prefer to um, not touch the filing fees on on this amendment. We do have another stop if that's something that we want to discuss further, but uh, I think for the purposes of this conversation, I would urge a no vote. Uh, 
Senator Morrison, did you get a chance to look at this prior to the meeting here today? I did not, no. Any questions? Uh, Senator Limmer. Well, Mr. Chairman, uh, everyone I heard give testimony was speaking in favor of this bill because it would encourage more people to participate in the election process, especially as a candidate. So I would think that putting a limit uh, on a filing fee would encourage that even more. Having a very sizable filing fee, that alone could be a barrier to uh, a smaller party wanting to run for office. So I don't believe, uh, Senator Morrison, that that this is doing any harm for your bill if the true purpose of your bill is to encourage more participation by uh, a wider group of people that want to run for office. So 25 bucks is, most anybody can muster up 25 bucks. It may be a little more difficult for some to muster up $500. So quite honestly, I think the A4 amendment actually encourages more people to run for office and isn't that what we want? Senator Morrison. Uh, Mr. Chair and Senator Limmer, uh, thank you for your comments. I'm going to urge a no vote on this. The fees that we see listed are $20, $5, $80, $40, and I don't know why we'd single out a ranked choice voting election to have a different filing fee than others. Senator Wesley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I think um, certainly having a conversation about filing fees may be a worthy conversation, but I think that we should have that separate from this bill. Uh, my understanding of the purpose of this bill really is to eliminate the barrier for cities that may want to, or other localities that may want to uh, adopt ranked choice voting. This removes the barrier for them to do that. And I think that any discussion about fees um, should be a discussion had separately from this. Anyone else? Um, we have a motion here. Uh, Senator Coran moves the A4 amendment. Um, and you asked for a roll call, I believe. Is that correct? And the uh, clerk will take the roll. Senator Carlson. No. Senator Westland. No. Senator Coran. Yes. Senator Anderson. Yes. Senator Barr. Aye. Senator Bolden. No. Senator Swazinski. No. Senator Dorning. Yes. Senator Limmer. Yes. Senator Marty. No. Senator Matthews. Yes. Senator Mitchell. No. Senator Port. No. Senator Rest. There being six ayes and eight nays, the motion does not prevail. Any other amendments? Any other discussion? Discussion of amendments, discussion of the bill itself? Mr. Chairman. Senator Limmer. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I just wanted to make a comment that in a committee process, there's no such thing as a germaneness rule. So any amendment can be considered. Uh, usually it's best to have an issue that's somewhat related to an issue. So I know there was a question or a observation that this particular A4 amendment that we just voted on uh, didn't have any place in this bill. But nevertheless, anyone can bring any amendment to any bill in, in consideration by a committee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, thank you, Senator Limmer. You are, you are correct. Uh, you know, this is the, the original committee. Um, 
However, we did vote on it and we turned it down, so I don't think it really made a difference. Thank you. Senator Wesson. Uh, just for clarity, I wasn't, in case you were referring, I wasn't making a germaneness argument. I was just simply saying I'd prefer to have the discussion on a different date, but thank you. Any other questions? M Mr. Chair, along Senator the lines, Grant. along those lines, um, for, for people watching, is that the Committee of Origin is the committee to have these debates and thorough debates about every aspect of a bill, right? Once it moves beyond that, then that same methodology is used to stifle any debate, and, it's, and each committee from this point forward is limited to just the specific jurisdiction. When we get it in state gov, it'll be about rulemaking, those types of things. And so if it's not done here, there literally is no other place to have that debate. So to say wait till it moves on um, is, is, is disingenuous and it really robs the committee of the work and it robs the citizenry of that thorough review because that's our responsibility uh, in this committee as the committee of jurisdiction. So I think, I, I get it, we, we get to vote it down. It, it's a precursor to the, to the amendment you'll see in, in uh, state gov when it, when it cruises through there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Senator Coran. You, you are correct. This is the Committee of Your Origin, and we did consider the bill, and everybody had the chance to comment on it. So uh, we'll move on. Any other uh, questions of the, uh, the Senator? Senator Coran. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, so in the, uh, in the bill, it's got um, on pages 9 and 10, states that ties will be resolved by the local election official. It doesn't, what, what, are, what are the tiebreakers and, the, and how are they supposed to uh, use it? How, it, it really doesn't provide any definition of how tiebreakers are um, determined. It just said they shall be determined. Could somebody give us a great example of how those tiebreakers, what are the examples that have been in place today that would, that we, if the work has been done to understand it, but guidelines, wouldn't we want to put guidelines or methodologies and, and approved methods to, to decide a tie so it's not an arbitrary decision by one person? Senator Morrison. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Curran. You know, we've, we do have experience with ranked choice voting in five cities in Minnesota. Um, we certainly can have, and there is a, that's kind of the point of ranked choice voting, is that you win by a majority or you win by, a majority plus um, the you win a majority of support of the votes. Um, so there, for the details of how that's done, uh, we could ask. We worked in collaboration with the Office of the Secretary of State to craft this bill. Uh, we could ask for specific the details about how mm -hmm. that's done um, in elections from them, or perhaps um, from uh, an expert in ranked choice voting. But I think I'd probably start with the Secretary of State. If you don't mind. <laughs> thank you. Please identify yourself again for the record. Uh, thank you, Mr. Senator. Chair and Senator Cran. Um, I was able to find a reference to ties on line 9.6. And if there's a, a different reference, please let me know. Um, uh, and I, I believe that this is consistent with um, how ties are uh, remedied in other um, other races, but it does say that ties between candidates with the fewest votes must be resolved by lot by the ranked choice voting official. Um, I, to give sort of a practical example, um, I have a, a memory from a few years ago of um, former Ramsey County election administrator Joe Mansky uh, with, I think it was, I don't, I don't know what vessel they used, um, but it, it literally was uh, members of the public were picking um, numbers out of a hat, sort of a thing, um, or the pieces of paper might have had names on them. So it was drawn by lot in a public, it was a public meeting that they did that at. Um, and so I would imagine that that um, similar process, this uh, reallocation process is um, open to the public. Uh, and has to be um, you know, noticed and, like I said, open to the public. And so, uh, that I would um, I would anticipate that that would be a similar fashion. Mr. Chair, Senator Grant. Uh, thank you, Ms. Freeman. But uh, correct me if I'm wrong. But didn't as we went through this last session, um, didn't we ultimately create a task force 
in the Secretary of State's office to produce a report that would provide the very clarity and guidance for ranked choice voting in Minnesota due sometime next year in 2025? Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, Mr. Senator, Senator Craig, we, we did not create a task force. Um, the Secretary, the Office of the Secretary of State studied looking at statewide ranked choice voting, which is a different conversation than the one we're having today about this bill. Mr. Chair. Senator Grant. Thank you for the clarity, Senator Morrison. Uh, Ms. Freeman, in, in this particular case, you described a scenario, but shouldn't we have a prescripted methodology so we make sure that it's not an arbitrary de decision? Because it doesn't say, well, you could use a coin toss, you could draw a random number, or any person in that room could make the same, just could make a decision. And so that's, that's why it seems that pretty, it's very complex. Every iteration of this whole process is complex. But why, why we wouldn't be able to clearly define a policy or some set of guidelines that would um, deal with a, uh, with a tie. So thank you, Ms. Freeman. Senator Matthews. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I had a follow-up question uh, to what was just asked for um, the Secretary of State's office. Um, I read over the language right before you quoted it, and I want to ask you uh, the sentence after what you read, ties between candidates with the fewest votes must be resolved by lot by the ranked choice voting local election official. The next sentence says the candidate chosen by lot must be defeated. That's not, that, I don't understand what that means. You win, and because you win, you lose. What is missing here in this language? Ms. Freeman? Thank okay. you, Chair. All right. Uh, and Senator Matthews. Um, so uh, I believe that this paragraph is talking about um, uh, eliminating candidates. Um, and so this would be a scenario where a candidate, um, it would be, you know, two candidates who were uh, at a ranking level where they would be eliminated. And so um, essentially what they're, what they're, what, what is being drawn by lot is who to be, who will be eliminated or who would be defeated in this particular, um, in, you know, 9.3 to 9.9. .9. Senator Matthews. Mr. Chair, but this whole conversation is about tiebreakers for determining the winner. Why do we need tiebreakers to determine the people who do not win? Whether you have, you know, 10 candidates for one seat or 10 candidates for four seats, um, we care more about the results at the top than we do at the bottom. for purposes of figuring out tiebreakers and continuing out how to further flesh out further rounds of tiebreakers if they continue to be tied. Ms. Freeman. Uh, thank you. So I think that um, this at this point where this subdivision or this section would come into play would be um, for the candidate with the fewest votes. And so, um, you know, as um, say we're at the beginning of the process here, um, the candidate with the fewest votes out of all the candidates who ran in the election, um, that would be the first candidate, the candidate to be uh, removed, and then their votes would be reallocated. Like then, um, uh, the votes for that candidate would then be reallocated. So if there were two candidates who the you know lowest vote was five each, the determination of who would be eliminated um, first would be uh, drawn by lot. Um, which is how all uh, election ties are handled um, across state statute. And so um, the, the person to be sort of eliminated first um, in the first round or in subsequent rounds, if there is a tie, would be drawn by lot. The person drawn by lot would be eliminated. And then those um, the uh, votes for the, that candidate would then be reallocated if people did rank other um, candidates. And then another round would um, would go through of tabulation. Mr. Chair. Senator Matthews. So we're only eliminating one candidate per round? There's no window, there's no opportunity for however many candidates you have on a slate 
and you'll probably have a general um, alignment early on of who your higher ranked ones are, who your lower ranked ones are. We're gonna go through this process, one candidate per round, as many as it takes to get to the final one rather than multiple eliminations. Ms. Freeman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair uh, and Mr. Senator Chair. Matthews. Um, so yes, I, I do believe that there's, um, that it goes uh, round by round um, and uh, can candidates are eliminated um, and then their votes are, because those votes need to be redistributed um, or essentially any of the ballots that uh, had that person ranked then need to be redistributed to anyone else that was ranked on their ballot um, if they supported any other candidates. And so it is a round by round. Um, scenario. I think there's instances where um, um, this particular bill uh, with the amendment requires write-in candidates to be um, to register uh, with the jurisdiction and so any unregistered um, write-in candidates would be eliminated um, but beyond that I do believe it's a round by round. Mr. Chair. Senator Matthews. And then my final question with regards to technical pieces of the bill is why on page 17 of the bill, why are we reducing the amount of time that we can look at and test voting systems from 14 days to three days? That strikes me as going in the wrong direction of transparency, openness, honesty, integrity in our election system. What's the reason for that change of the author or whoever needs to take that question? Ms. Freeman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Matthews. Um, so this was a change that was made, um, partially made uh, last year in 2023 um, to uh, change the time frame to at least three days before the voting equipment is used. Um, that change was made in conjunction with uh, direct balloting. Um, and this bill inserts a few um, requirements for if ranked choice voting is used that um, the essentially the um, that ranked choice voting is tested um, and is part of that public accuracy test and preliminary accuracy test. Follow up Senator Matthews. Uh, Mr. Chair then we should probably change the language to say at least 14 days before the voting equipment is used because we've shrunk the amount of time where you know within 14 days maybe is 13, 12, 11 days, um, and, and the more, more is better, and I think we can all bipartisanly agree on that. More openness and more transparency is better than less. And now we have in here that three days is the minimum, so yeah, 14 days uh, would, is still applicable, would still be nice if uh, it is available at that time, but three days is the only requirement, and uh, I, I read this as a step in the wrong direction for uh, openness and transparency. Thank you. Ms. Freeman, would you like to answer that? Uh, thank you, uh, Chair and Senator Matthews. Um, just to clarify, so previously the requirement was within f 14 days of election day, um, and so uh, that could be uh, from day one to day 14 where public testing could happen, um, and so now it is at least three days before vo the voting equipment is used. Um, so voting equipment used on election day needs to be tested at least three days in advance. It could be tested uh, much further than that, uh, much further ahead of time than that. Um, and then, uh, yes, three days before any voting equipment is, is used. Um, Thank you. This is the can new I, requirement. If I can add in there that, uh, you know, the, the at least three means it's a wider window than within 14. So you could do it 20 days ahead, at least three days. Um, within 14, you could do the day before. Ms. Stinkel has something to add. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. We've identified a bit of an anomaly that 
in the engrossment of the bill here, which I think Ms. Freeman is trying to get at. Um, there are some things that are showing up on line 17.3 that appear to be a change. They're showing up as a change in law, but they're not actually a change in law. So if you were to look at the statute in chapter 206.83, current law says at least three days before voting equipment is used. Um, so that what looks like a change to at least three days is actually current law. And somewhere along the way this bill being introduced, there was, there was a mistake. So current law says at least three days. It's not a change being made in this bill. There was just a mistake in the, in the jacketing process. Thank you, Ms. Stengel. Um, and we do have a little switch that we need to do here. Senator Morrison must go to uh, attend to another bill. And uh, Senator Mitchell, is, as a co-author, is going to step in. Mr. Chair, I leave you with my able co-author. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Morrison. And so, Senator Mitchell, as a co-author, I think everyone knows you, and, uh, but I'll still ask you to identify yourself as a co-author. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I am Senator Nicole Mitchell, member of the Elections Committee, and I'm proud to be taking over for Senator Morrison. Thank you, Senator Mitchell. Uh, Senator Matthews, do we have a follow-up? Okay, thank you. Okay, Senator Cran. Thank you, Mr. Chair. On the uh, A5 amendment on line 4.2, is there a reason why we're deleting the July, it, it has to do with delete, deleting the July campaign finance reporting requirement? Can Ms. Can Freeman I answer that, please? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't catch what you said. Senator Mitchell. 4.2 of the... I, I would like to request that Ms. Okay. Freeman answer that. Ms. Freeman. Thank you, Chair and Senator Matthews. Um, this was an, another case where uh, um, the, the bill itself was uh, jacketed in 2022, or excuse me, in 2023, uh, and since then, um, um, this... A, a similar provision, I don't know if the exact wording is there, but the spirit of the wording um, was passed in the uh, state government omnibus bill last session. And so um, the I know the wording is different. I saw um, um, Beth Fraser nod her head, but um, the spirit of uh, the reporting needs to still happen on the same um, schedule uh, is already in state law. So we caught that one, but we didn't remedy um, the three days uh, portion that you pointed out, Senator Matthews. So. Thank you, Ms. Freeman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Other comments? Ms. I, Go ahead. Are you, yeah, I know you're trying to get moving. Um, yes. If there are no other comments, so. Okay. Ms. Mr. Grant. Chair, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll continue to I'll move and we'll hopefully we'll get out of here. Um, so the opposition to this, you know, is, is it hasn't proven to meet any of the objectives that are stated that are, that are wonderful, the barriers that they've been inserted. Um, and I'll just, I'll, I'll be brief, far different than we were last time when we, when we covered this bill. Um, but I'm just gonna go lean back on the Larry, Larry Jacobs and Penny Thomas uh, review of the University of Minnesota um, Humphrey School of Business or School of Public Affairs is, is when we look through all the claims, right, all of the things that make this thing wonderful, the reduced polarization in political parties, um, they found in their studies that, you know, a particularly sophisticated anal analysis found that ranked choice voting actually increased animosity among, Demo among Democrats and Republicans compared to the current system of, a, of the uh, plurality system. Study, same, another study in 2020 found ranked choice voting in those elections were um, we're more open to new parties in Maine, but the independent and third party candidates still only received 6.6% of the vote. The second claim that, they, that, they've been, that has been moved forward is the increase in diversity of election, elected of government officials. Ranked choice voting uh, may have contributed to an increase in the number of candidates who are racially and, and ethnic minorities, but there's little evidence that they're more successful um, in winning office. And so, and I think we saw examples here of those that were successful but they went out and ran great campaigns regardless of the, camp, of the voting system. The study also found 2% increase in the number of women winning elections to the city council in the Bay Area, in Cal Bay Area in California um, after the introduction. But this is, have, may have been result in increased recruitment of women candidates, uh, a national trend. Then 
the uh, third ranked choice claim that was covered in this study is increased voter turnout and engagement uh, voters of color. And so a series of studies report that ranked choice voting decreases turnout and the use of, rank of, of ranking opportunities among, amongst African Americans. Conversely, whites were more likely to report ranking a higher number of candidates. Overall, the analysis found no difference in turnout in cities using ranked choice voting compared to those using current systems. They report errors, confusion, lower turnout due to the greater complexity of ranked choice voting and its process of ranking candidates and tabulating multiple rounds of voting. The other, the last claim, and I'll, I'll leave it with this, is that the ranked choice voting um, decreased negative campaigning. And their studies found that only slightly more positive tone in newspaper articles in cities with ranked choice voting compared to those without it, but Twitter traffic or social media traffic is far more negative um, in, in ranked choice voting. And then a separate study um, showed increased negativity in, in Maine's ranked choice voting elections. And so um, I haven't known, I know uh, Larry Jacobs and the, that institute, and they haven't been the bastions of conservative politics, and, and so they wouldn't share my political views. But this is the work that they did. And so everywhere we've turned, we've seen that the initial goal of maybe candidate increasing or candidate participation increased a ton in, until the restrictions were put in place, and it went back to um, to a more traditional um, participation level. Three, four candidates, two, three, four candidates uh, in an election. If you look at look back at the uh, those that had ranked choice voting stats in Minnesota, 34 races used ranked choice voting. Ten races were competitive past the first ballot. So, so a third of them were successful. They must have had great candidates, got the plurality. I think Mayor Carter, I think he's won all of his elections by, by uh, a plurality and majority on first round. And so, you know, with that, 29% of the race, races uh, Minnesota last year were, were only competitive past the first round. 15 races only had one or two candidates, 44%. And so it hasn't driven that comp competitiveness and, and increased access to the ballots. And... Um, so for those reasons, Mr. Chair, I'm going to continue to be against this voting process and methodology. I don't think it accomplishes any of our goals of creating a trustworthy system and transparent that everybody understands how their vote, how their vote was counted and how their vote mattered. And so for that, Mr. Chair, I would urge a, a no vote. And Mr. Chair, I don't, I'm not sure, did we uh, request a roll call yet? I don't think we have. I request a roll call. Thank you. Roll call requested. Roll call granted. Uh, Senator Mitchell, would you like to uh, respond to the challenges there? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I would just like to emphasize that, um, one, this is one study, and we have a number of other studies showing uh, the benefits of this, but I, I really want to emphasize that this is an option. This is just giving communities the ability to look at what is best for them, whether it would work for them to administer it, um, whether this is something that they want in their community and have that local choice. And so I, I know a lot of people really want to keep as much local choice um, at those local levels as possible. And this is an opportunity and, it, and then it would be incumbent on that community to see if it worked for them, if um, they had the outreach to make sure their voters n knew the process and everything else. But this is just an option because right now under our current system, communities cannot explore this under the law. So we want them to be able to have this option if they want it. Any other discussion? Um, one thing, I, I guess I just have to respond a bit to the, uh, to the study. I'm wondering, you know, unfortunately, uh, Council Member Bowie is not here, but I would like to have her repeat what she said during her presentation that we now have an all-female and larger uh, people of color council in St. Paul, and I think if, if anything gives you uh, confidence that this has given a uh, more uh, diversity in a city that's used it, that's, this is it, this is the demonstration. Um, would you like to, to speak? We have a, a person coming up from the audience. So please identify yourself again and uh, let us know what you're thinking. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair and Committee. Paula Romeo, Minnetonka City Council Ward 3. We are the other all-female city council in Minnesota, aside from St. Paul. Under ranked choice voting, we have uh, elected two African-American uh, council members. So, and we also have different faith, uh, people of different faiths uh, on our city council. So uh, for Minnetonka, which is an 80 three uh, percent white community to have such a diverse uh, city council I think speaks volumes to what ranked choice voting has helped accomplish in our community um, as well as the all-female city council even though nobody knows about us. Thank you. I, I need to ask you a question. Yeah. Uh, you did a, a, a special election for confirming whether ranked choice voting should continue in your city. Do, do you recall what that uh, the results were of that election? Uh, the results of that referendum um, this past year was, I don't have the exact numbers, I'm sure somebody else uh, in, in the audience does, but I know it was wider, the margin was wider than the original adoption margin, which was quite significant. So I believe it was at least a 10 point margin, but perhaps somebody else can tell me more. So that's kind of it, it, it was a larger margin of people who voted to retain ranked choice voting in 2023 than voted to originally adopt it okay. in 2020. So would it be logical to say that once people get used to it or learn about it, that maybe they favor it even more? Yes. And I would also say that um, having uh, seven or eight candidates is one way to do it, but having three or four candidates is also a very valid way to run. You can have people who are, you know, kind of across the spectrum. Um, so it isn't just Republicans or Democrats, which we don't have partisanship, obviously, at the city level. But you can have a wide variety of views um, that are represented and people can choose from that. And so all I can say is that our voter turnout has gone up 100% in two cycles in my ward. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Chair, as long as we're going down that Senator line of questions, so, um, and uh, the city council member. Um, Ramele. Ramele. <laughs> like the month of May. So how, many, how, many, uh, how much uh, money did you record as reported spent against that initiative by Fair Vote Minnesota versus the local citizens? I don't know. I'm, I'm not privy to that. I don't know. I wasn't part of that. So, um, I just I was a candidate, so I ran as part of yep. as a, a ranked choice voting yeah. candidate. I can just speak to my experience in that. And, and so the fair vote dollars that were used were pretty significant in that effort, both one for the initial race, or the initial adoption of it, and as well as those against the proponents who are actually raising local money. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Senator Grant. Uh, Senator Bolden. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, uh, uh, Senator Mitchell, for stepping in and bringing this bill. Uh, at, given our robust discussion at this point, I would move that Senate File 3868, as amended, be recommended to pass and be referred to state, local government, and elections. Thank you, Senator Bolden. Uh, we have had a ranked choice, or <laughs> we have had a, it's on my mind now, huh? Uh, we have had a roll call requested, and the clerk will take the roll. Senator Carlson. Yes. Senator Westland. Yes. Senator Coran. No. Senator Anderson. No. Senator Barr. No. Nope. Senator Bolden. Aye. Senator Swazinski. Yep. Senator Dorning. No. Senator Limmer. No. Senator Marty. Yes. Senator Matthews. My first rank is no, and my second rank is also no. <laughs> <laughs> Senator Mitchell. Yes. Senator Port. Yes. Senator Rest. There being eight aye and six nay votes, uh, Senate file 3868 as amended is recommended to pass and forward to the uh, uh, state gov and, and, uh, state and local government. veterans. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Mitchell. And uh, uh, 
Senator, oh, yes. And Senator Matthews, your, your use of rank choice is noted. Thank you. Okay, so we have, we have uh, two other bills, and I really thank all of you for being concise in your testimony and being concise in your, your comments. So we're, uh, we're being given a little bit of time here to get two more bills passed. The next one is Senate File 3871 by Senator Swazinski. And this being your first committee, you have an A1 author's amendment? I do. Uh, Senator Westland moves the A1 author's amendment. Uh, all those in favor, say aye. Aye. All opposed, nay. Uh, the motion is adopted, and the A1 amendment is approved. <laughs> Senator Swazinski, anytime you're ready. Yeah, um, I feel like I'm back in class when I started. Everybody, all the students used to walk out, so. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, whenever I speak to parent groups, one of the things I love asking them is, how, how, many, how much time did you spend teaching your kid to, to drive? And the room usually breaks out with big smiles and laughter, and, and I hear stories about scratched, um, dented cars and banged up garages, and um, and how much time they spent, and oh my God, what a hassle teaching my kid how to vote. And everybody's got a good story, and I'll let the room, you know, share their little anecdotes, and and then I'll pause and I'll say, how much time did you just spend teaching your kid how to vote? And it's silence because they all realize, irony of ironies, I haven't spent a minute teaching my kid to vote. I teach them how to drive, I teach them how to hold the fork, I teach them how to, uh, whatever else we teach as parents, but I think we've let down our kids on the most fundamental, maybe arguably the most important job we have as parents is teaching them how to vote. So last year when we passed the civics bill, um, requiring all juniors and seniors to take a citizenship class, I thought this perfect um, moment would occur that let's register the kids as part of the class. So all 16, 17 year olds would be registered as a result of this class and it's this perfect moment. Now they're educated and they're registered and on the next election they're ready to vote and um, it's perfect system in my opinion. Um, we are present, or I'm presenting Bill 3871 along with Senator Bolden and Senator Marty. It corrects a couple um, kerfuffles, if that's even a word, um, that came up in the last few months. And I also um, wanted to take out the collection of data that required the school districts to collect um, some data to make sure the school districts are actually distributing the, the registration cards and whatnot. And I, I just felt it was an undue burden upon the Secretary of State's office. So that's the bill. Um, I'm a, I do, three. Secretary of State Simons, one. Secretary of State's office will be, rec will be represented by Ms. Freeman. Please state your name for the record and continue with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Senator Swedzinski, for bringing this bill. Um, I am, yes, filling in for the Secretary. He's on the road today, as you all heard just a little bit ago, um, and had to hop off to his next um, event. So uh, I'm here today uh, to support um, Senate File 3871. This bill clarifies um, and expands which students a school district should provide the opportunity to register or pre-register. Um, Secretary Simon and our outreach team have uh, visited a number of high schools across the state um, as, as he has done um, every year in office. Um, but recently, um, starting in uh, June of 2023, um, to talk about uh, the Minnesota election system as well as pre-registration and registration for those that are eligible. 
Um, so pre-registration is about getting good habits started early and encouraging young people to think of themselves as both civically engaged as well as voters before they turned 18. So in 2023, uh, we joined over half the states in the country that are red, blue, and purple in their makeup who permit pre-registration. Pre-registration is a tested and proven way to engage future voters, and we know that those who vote when they're young are most likely to become lifelong voters. So the bill ensures that, um, yes, all students receive information about registration and pre-registration, and we hope you will also join us in supporting. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Would you like to address, we got a couple of quick questions for Ms. Freeman. Would you, would you like to do that now or wait till later when she has to come back? I'll, I'll be here. I think we'll, we'll wait till okay. we get the Thank testifiers you. You. completed, if the testifiers are here. The next testifier I have is uh, uh, St. Paul School Board member, Halla Henderson. Please identify yourself for the record and continue yes. with your testimony. Of course. Uh, my name is Hala Henderson. I'm happy to be here today. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, my name is, again, Hala Henderson, and I have the privilege of serving as the chair of the St. Paul School Board. Um, and I'm here to offer my support for Senate File 3871, which would really just require districts such as mine to provide voter registration materials to students twice per year. Uh, and before I was ever a school board member, I, um, I was an, a youth organizer for student-led groups like the Minnesota Youth Council. And I saw the impact young people had on policy issues and their tenacity in organizing and inspiring their peers to use their voice for, for action. And oftentimes the voices that I have turned to for support or for insight have been, have been young people, our students. At the same time, I saw the opportunity that we had as adults to make civic engagement um, as accessible as possible. We know that when potential voters have access and when they have education, they oftentimes vote. And we also know that when they don't, when it's difficult to learn about the process, when it's confusing or when even there are two or three additional steps, um, it's harder to get folks invested. So I find this bill exciting because it begins to solve that problem. Last year, we saw the passage of pre-registration of 16 and 17-year-olds, a measure that will begin to prepare our young people to cast their ballot once they're 18 and legally able to do so. And this bill will not require students to register. Rather, it will allow us to offer access to voter registration forms in the place, place our students spend the bulk of their time, our school buildings. We spend a lot of time talking about our young people and the fact that they are our future. Um, but for many of them, the future is right now. And our responsibility is to give them the tools to, to shape it. We can and we must make civic engagement more accessible. And I would implore you to support measures such as this. Um, so thank you for your time today. And I look forward to hearing support for this bill. Thank you, Ms. Henderson. Uh, we have also uh, Jaden Leary, St. Louis Park High School senior. High school junior, sorry. Mr. Chair, I just want to um, make a point um, that the testifier just said, called the bill exciting. And how often do we get to hear that about our bill? Hi, good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. I'm grateful for this opportunity to discuss a topic that is not only pivotal to our democracy, but also something that I had deeply worked with before. My experience with voter pre-registration started this past fall. I worked orchestrating, leading some of the first statewide pre-registration events within high schools across the state. This initiative allowed me to glean several in insights into pre-registration and its impacts on the youth. Firstly, the empowerment students who took charge of these events was enormous. Despite facing numerous obstacles, these young leaders exhibited a profound sense of accomplishment in mobilizing their peers towards early pre-registration. Someone as far as even to start events at other schools completely on their own, separate from us. Secondly, the feedback from students who underwent the pre-registration process was overwhelmingly positive. They found the procedure to not only be simple and straightforward, but also a no-brainer. This ease of access and minimal effort required trans translated into a higher willingness among teens to engage in it. However, throughout this, I noticed distinct 
challenges faced by the teens, most notably the reluctance of some educational institutions to facilitate these events. This resistance emerged as a considerable barrier, impeding our efforts to make pre-registration a widespread and efficient practice across schools. The importance of pre-registration is real. Pre-registration leads to around two to nine percent increase in youth voter turnout in states that have been implemented it. By integrating voter pre-registration into the educational curriculum, we not only simplify the process for the youth, but also ensure that all students, irrespective of their background, have equal access to information about their civic duties and rights. Furthermore, embedding civic engagement within the educational fr framework serves a dual purpose. It prepares the youth for active participation in democracy while also fostering a sense of responsibility and belonging. Schools being central to our communities and being something that students spend all of their time in, time in are ideally positioned to act as a catalyst for civic engagement, offering a unique opportunity to instill democratic values and practices. And while we made significant strides in the last cycle promoting pre-registration among young voters, there's still much to be done. We must continue to advocate for the integration of civic engagement activities within our school and overcome institutional barriers that not only, sorry, that overcome institutional barriers to ensure that every young Minnesotan is not only prepared to vote, but also understands the importance of their vote. That's why I support this bill to ensure that all students have equal access to information in their high school, regardless of where they live or their capacity to lead voter registration efforts. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Leary. Any amendments from the members or the committee, the committee on the bill? Thank you. Uh, any discussion? Any questions? Mr. Chair, I have a Senator I have, I have two questions. I'll just ask. Um, the the first one is: Does this increase costs at all for the education facilities? Just changing the methods, I believe, but there's no additional cost. We took out the, uh, the, the, the hassle factor. They don't have to collect any data anymore. So I, to the best of my knowledge, there's no expense at all. They just provide the cards that the department or the you know, Secretary of State office brings to the school. Thank you, Senator Szynski. Additional question for Ms. Freeman. Ms. Freeman, identify yourself again and uh, continue with your testimony. Uh, Nicole Freeman, Office of the Secretary of State. Um, do you, uh, I'm sorry, could you repeat the question, Senator Cran? Yeah, uh, no, Cran. This, this, I've got a new question for, you, okay. for Ms. Freeman. So, Ms. Freeman, the, the concern I have about 16, 17 year olds, great, we're registering. Jaden did a great job on his testimony, so kudos. Um, is so 16 and 17 year olds refresh my mind. So, we changed last year that 16, 17 year olds pre registered either through driver's license and or through any enrollment, right, that we've created are now deemed um, uh, inactive. Inactive voter records on statewide voter registration system are also deemed as not public data. Are 16 and 17 year olds as not public data being provided to the ERIC system, which your agreement requires you to share all active and inactive voters, are those records being shared with ERIC? Ms. Freeman. Uh, thank you, Senator uh, and Senator uh, Chair Carlson and Senator Cran. Um, so the the status of uh, pre-registered voters is actually pended. Um, so they're kind of in this holding pattern. So it is a separate status than inactive um, or active. Uh, I I don't know off the top of my head which statuses are provided through Eric. I'm happy to um, follow up, but but they are uh, in pended status. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you, Ms. Freeman, because I believe your agreement says that you must share all, regardless of status, and so active, inactive, or otherwise, so I will follow up in a, with a written request to uh, post the committee. So thank you. Thank you, Senator Grant, for the question. Other questions? Senator Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, maybe this uh, the question is for Ms. Stengel. It says uh, on line 1.12 and 1.13, students of the school district will, uh, or district who are eligible to register or pre-register. What are the requirements for eligibility, uh, Ms. Stengel? I 
Ms. Freeman, if you know off the top of your head, I may, you may answer. Sure, thank you, Chair Carlson and Senator Anderson. Uh, so the uh, requirements to register um, are that you need to be uh, over the age of registering. Um, I'll, I'll do registering first and then pre-registering to distinguish. Uh, so uh, over the age of 18, um, a resident of Minnesota for at least the past 20 days. Um, uh, you need to uh, be not currently incarcerated, uh, a citizen of the United States, and not have been deemed incompetent by a court or have your rights removed um, by a court. Um, I think that that is the, the list in totality. Um, and then for pre-registration, uh, the difference uh, in requirements is just related to age. Um, so for pre-registration, you could be a 16 or 17 year old, but otherwise must be uh, meet all those other eligibility requirements. So a US citizen, a Minnesota resident. So Senator Anderson. Mr. Chair, uh, Ms. Freeman, if the pre-registered student at 16, 17, when they turn 18, if they have all the other, if there are some of the eligibility requirements for an 18-year-old that were not met, are they're pre-registered, but when they turn 18, say they have been, they've been a juvenile or they've been incarcerated uh, at that age, what do they then automatically fall off of that registration? Ms. Freeman. Thank you, Chair Carlson and Senator uh, Anderson. Um, so uh, we do receive, uh, the office does receive uh, reports from the Department of Corrections um, and some other sources that uh, do indicate a list of uh, folks who are currently incarcerated and therefore not eligible to vote. Um, and so those lists are uh, passed on from our office to county election administrators um, to uh, apply then a challenge um, to any records for people who are currently incarcerated. Uh, we also receive a list of people who were released from incarceration, and so um, the status can then be changed. So uh, they would be updated, and I guess the, the high-level answer is they would be updated in the same manner as any other voter would be updated. So, Mr. Chair. Senator Anderson. Uh, Ms. Freeman, because this is uh, registra registration of a, vote of a presumed voter, uh, that information will be available to the public? Ms. Freeman. Uh, thank you, Chair Carlson and Senator Anderson. Um, so information that would be available to the public, uh, uh, a voter's data isn't um, available to the public until they are an active registered voter. Um, and then there is uh, pieces of information that are, um, that are uh, eligible um, and public information. Um, I don't know if that if there's a, a follow-up question, feel free to, if I didn't get so to Mr. the root Chair, of your question. Mr. Anderson. Uh, Pre-registering as a 16-year-old or a 17-year-old for voting, because they're underage, supposedly, uh, they're 18 or older, is that information then because they've pre-registered or registered for voting? Is that, uh, is that going to be uh, available for that's going to be kept secret. Ms. Freeman. Thank you, Chair Carlson and Senator Anderson. Um, yes, so uh, uh, we, we uh, talked about this uh, throughout um, the committee process uh, last year um, related to pre-registration. Um, and uh, yes, uh, the, the data for 16 and 17-year-olds um, will be is considered private data um, for those records that are pended. Once someone does turn 18, um, then the um, data uh, privacy or uh, information that is public record, um, you know, then shifts over once someone does become an active registered voter on their 18th birthday. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Freeman, I, I guess I'd like to ask a clarifying question that really what we're doing is we're pre-registering the 16-year-olds that uh, were not previously eligible to be registered, but there already was a demographic that could be registered because they would turn 18 before the next election. So these pre-registered individuals would be handled similarly to the ones that could, could be registered because they would turn 18 before the next election. Is that the, the correct way to look at it? Uh, thank you, Chair Carlson. Um, yes, this bill specifically uh, just touches on um, requiring 
high schools, um, school districts to provide paper or electronic voter registration applications to their students, to anyone who's um, 16 or older eligible to register or pre-register. Um, and uh, But yes, your description of um, how the legislature expanded pre-registration last year to include 16-year-olds and 17-year-olds who might not be uh, 18 on election day uh, is correct. Okay, thank you. Senator Barr. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we're debating the A1, but we haven't moved that yet. So did somebody actually want to move the DE to get the bill in proper form? Yeah, we did. Did we? We did move it, yeah. Oh, okay. Really? Then I missed that part. I'm sitting here. To, I don't. I just remember your joke about uh, everybody walking out of the room, and I don't remember actually moving the DE. I'll take so. that as a compliment. Yeah. <laughs> you got me on process. Thank you. Thank you for watching out for us. Other discussion. Mr. Chair, just quest good Senator question. This path, uh, what's the path this is taken? Is this going to add policy? Uh, first? This is going to be laid over. Okay. Thank you. So the, the uh, 30, 3871 is laid over for possible inclusion. Thank you. One more bill. Maybe we'll be able to make it by 5 o'clock. So we have Senator, uh, Senator Mitchell, and this is on census worker access. Senator Mitchell, proceed when you're ready. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I am here to present Senate file 3875. It should be in its correct order. And it is just what I would say is a pretty quick and easy chair uh, change um, to uh, the access that census workers have to apartment buildings. Much like when we go door knocking, we have access to apartment buildings. We can do that outreach. Census workers need to be able to talk to people to collect the data that they're getting. I've been a census worker in, a, in the past. And um, that is a really important piece to getting the data collected. Um, I did happen to do it in 2020, which was an unusual year. So if you look at what the current law says, that access is through July 1st. Well, that was a year that we weren't doing our collection until August and September. And there's sometimes with uh, kind of pre-testing of the process that they need to get in there even before January to kind of uh, lay the groundwork. And sometimes there's, you have to go in multiple times. So you might, even in a, a normal year and not a COVID year where everything's getting pushed back, there might be a need for them to go in after January. So this just changes it so that they can go in and do their work at any point um, that it, it is necessary. Uh, I will also say, if you remember 2020, we kept a congressional seat in Minnesota by less than 100 people. And it is apartments that tend to be the least counted. So we want to make sure there's that access um, because we know how important that representation is. Just as an aside, I counted several hundred people. So I like to joke that I got us that last congestion. Uh, congressional seat. Um, again, in the interest of time, I'm just trying to be really brief because I actually think this is an easy one. Do you have anything you have to add to this? Mm -hmm. I am going to keep my testifier here for questions then um, because, as I said, I think this is pretty straightforward. I think we are blessed here to have Dr. Susan Bauer, the uh, okay. state demographer, uh, if as a testifier and that uh, supporter of the information that's needed for this. So, Dr. Brower, do you have some things to say here? Um, I would just say that I support this bill. Any access that we can provide? Oh. Please put your, yeah, put your name on the, in the record. Oh. My name is Susan Brower. I'm Minnesota State Demographer, and I work in the Department of in Administration. Thank you for having me here today. Um, I'm supportive of this bill. Anything we can do to support an accurate and fair count is a good thing for all Minnesotans, uh, not just those counted. Any amendments or discussion? Senator? Comment. Comments, Senator Kraft. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And Ms. Brower, I, I'm, I, I'm a supporter of the bill, but as long as you're here. The, uh, so in the 2020 census, for some reason, Minnesota was overcounted significantly. And so um, as our population, I think it's uh, 5.8 million people right now, has that overcount been accommodated in what the actual population is, or 
But then what number does that reflect from the census since we're overcounted? Have we adjusted the population in Minnesota in which we publish um, because of that overcount? Uh, Mr. Ms. Chair, Senator, uh, the Census Bureau does uh, adjust population estimates that it does after the census according to um, additional information like undercount and overcount. Um, so while ours was a statistically significant overcount, um, it was still at, at it was still relatively small number compared to the, the size of the state. Um, but yes, that's adjusted in further population estimates that are done in between censuses. Mr. Chair, and Ms. Senator Mr. Ms. Brower, the but so the uh, five point is the accurate population that it's off our off your site as adjusted by the Census Bureau. Dr. Brower. <laughs> Mr. Chair, uh, I believe we're still at 5.7 uh, million. I don't think we've hit that 5.8 mark yet. I, this looked at the site, so, um, oh. <laughs> and, and, so and, and you said it's insignificant, but it was actually enough that would have changed our congressional delegation, right? 250 plus thousand people were overcounted, so thank you. <laughs> uh, Dr. Mr. Brown. Chair, <laughs> so that is a, a measure of net overcount. It doesn't mean that everyone was counted um, and then additional people were counted. It's the net... Um, the net effect of everyone who is undercounted plus everyone who is double counted or erroneously counted. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, this bill would be laid over for possible inclusion. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Senator Mitchell. And with that, our uh, our agenda is complete, and I want to thank everyone, even those that are not here, for being so concise. And thank you, members. Uh, I was not looking forward to coming back tomorrow. <laughs> so thank you so much. And, we'll, uh, and the meeting is adjourned.